Uh, this last program is on forward air controllers, and uh, both of our speakers served in Vietnam. Uh, Chuck Burren and Dennis Darnell, and they were both Marines. And so, uh, Chuck, we'll start with you. Who was heckling already? I haven't even heard what we have to say yet. Just, uh, we don't need any comments from the audience, please. We'll have you escort it out and continue your obnoxious behavior, sir. Um, uh, uh, Chuck, can you talk about uh, when and how and why you got into the Marines? I got into the, you know, I was a Navy ROTC scholarship at the University of Kansas, and I went out on a midshipman cruise on a Navy destroyer. I decided that was not the life for me. So I decided to become a Marine so I wouldn't have to be on the ocean all the time. Always wanted to fly, but I didn't know if I could pass a flight physical. Eventually I, I took one when I was in college. Navy paid for my initial flight lessons, and I went off from there to Pensacola in 1963 and got my wings in 64. And uh, Dennis, how about you? When did you get in and how and why? I enlisted in 1966. Uh, I thought I had choices, but I really didn't. My father and uh, multiple brothers and uncles and family had been Marines for generations. So when it came time to serve, I thought about it, and I really, I really had only one direction to go. So when I finished college, uh, uh, there really wasn't an option. So I walked into a recruiter's office and uh, took a flight uh, test. Uh, kind of a pre to uh, the flight physical and uh, ended up instead of serving for a couple of years, signing up to go to Pensacola and, and ended up serving eight. Uh, but it was a pretty good trade-off. And, and so you wanted to fly right from the start. What was your ambition to fly? What kind of pilot did you want to be? I loved the A-4. Uh, <coughs> anything with a jet engine in it was uh, and when I walked into the recruiter's office, he had an F4 on the wall behind him, and I said, how do I get one of those? And he said, no problem, sign here. Um, later on, someone else introduced me to Huey helicopters. So, um, some of those early promises uh, were a little bit shaky, but uh, I never looked back. It did have a jet engine. Yes, it did. But it was connected to this big fan, and I hadn't counted on that. Uh, Chuck, you had uh, several tours in Vietnam. Can you, can you talk about your before you went? Uh, uh, before you went to Vietnam, how long have you been a Marine? Uh, I uh, got commissioned in uh, August, of July of 1963. I finished up flight training and joined my first squad at Trey Point, North Carolina, in January of 1965, and spent about 13 months there flying A4 Skyhawks. And, and uh, this is early, relatively early on in Vietnam, the buildup is, is going on. Right. And uh, for the stateside Marines, talking to some of those who are now coming back, what were the discussions? What did, what did you talk about as, as Marine officers? Well, that was the a, potential of going to Vietnam. Yeah, at that time, uh, the only Marine fixed wing in country were the folks with our uh, photographic reconnaissance squad, the MCJ. Uh, the first A-4 squadron went to July in 1965, in July. Uh, so we didn't really have people back from that yet to say much to us in, uh, during 1965. Uh, the people we had that we could talk to were the helicopter pilots. The Marines had been flying helicopters in the country from uh, April of 1962 on, uh, down in the Sock Trank, South of Saigon, and then uh, about four months later they moved up to the Nang area because the Army H-21s could not handle the uh, altitudes up there in some of the mountains, so they sort of switched places. So we would talk to some of the helicopter pilots uh, as they came back, and, and there was a lot going on at that time, pretty low key. They were primarily providing support for the Arvin troops uh, in the areas they were in. Uh, the Marine, big Marine landing didn't take place until mid 1965 at Da uh, They built the, air, the airfield at July in 1965, so we really didn't have a lot. What was interesting was the year I spent in the squadron, about half the time was learning to be a nuclear weapons delivery pilot. And then they finally decided, well, maybe these guys are going to go to Vietnam. We better start training them how to drop bombs and shoot rockets and things like that. But I actually ended up being nuclear weapons qualified in the A-4 uh, by the time I did go to, uh, over to Vietnam. 
And uh, when you got your assignment, how was that? Uh, you, you considered yourself a professional officer? Were you looking for a 20-year career? Or? Uh, hey, I was pretty young right out of college. I was just having fun. And I didn't really think about that until a few years later when I was actually too late to make a career out of it because of some indiscretions as a young lieutenant, shall we say. But how did you uh, how did you regard an assignment to Vietnam in those days? We all knew we were going to end up going there. Okay. I wasn't really concerned about it. Uh, you're you know you're a young uh, twenty some year old and uh, nobody's going to be able to do anything to you. They might get your buddy, but they're not going to get you. Uh, I got the Chu I uh, flew A fours there. On the other side, this close air support side. So I ended up with two tours, uh, being a bomber on one one tour. Spending some time on the ground, and then the second time I was a forward air controller for the whole tour. Okay. Dennis, uh, how about you? You came in a little bit later, and uh, so you had the opportunity to hear more stories before you went over to Vietnam. And what kind of discussions were there amongst officers about uh, uh, between those who'd gone over and those who were waiting to go? Most of the people that were in my class and were moving along uh, along my timeline thought that uh, it was going to be over soon. Uh, the guys that were coming back were saying, well, we were winning when I left and it's not going to last much longer. Uh, of course, they were wrong. Uh, we had no idea that it was going to stretch out as long as it uh, did. But we had been trained and we were excited about our mission. We were learning forward air controlling and uh, we thought it was a very worthwhile mission, and it was very much appreciated by the guys on the ground. So, uh, in honest, all honesty, we were looking forward to practicing our trade in Southeast Asia if we were called upon to do it. Okay, so, Chuck, your first uh, your first tour in Vietnam, you were dropping bombs, and can you talk about your perspective doing that, working with forward air controllers? Uh, yeah, I was, uh, in fact, my, my, my flew one orientation flight when I got to uh, VMA 211 in July, leaving right on the beach, beautiful area, nice cove, we had a beach, uh, the Vietnamese fishermen would bring along goose skin that we could buy from them, which was better than the, the beef rations we were eating from time to time. But my first uh, night when I got there, I, we, the Marines all flew to Okinawa first, and then we got on C-130s and they took us to Danang unloaded us there and we got our assignments at the depot there. Mine sent me to July, joined the squad in there, and we were still living in tent, hardback tents at that time. They had a platform on them, a plywood platform, and still had the tents in that set up. They hadn't started building the Southeast Asia huts yet. Uh, the runway we had was an 8,000 foot uh, AM2 matting runway, aluminum runway, and it had to be cut every so often because they built it on the same base, which didn't hold up very so uh, we ended up flying, uh, flying missions with half the runway with JATO takeoffs and arrested landings. But my first night there, nobody told you about what was going on. There happened to be an eight-inch gun battery right at the end, near the end of the runway, and all the uh, old hands would get up there about 11:30 at night or so, and we got a couple new guys in. We didn't tell them about it, and all of a sudden these eight-inch guns start firing. And you thought the world was coming to an end because they weren't more than a thousand meters away from us doing the shooting. And you bounce they, uh, could they distinguish between incoming and outgoing? And was that you, part of the part of the joke of the older? That was part of the joke. Is uh, you know you, you found out later on what it was. And you knew it was going to happen every night at the same time. The H and I fires. My first mission I flew was uh, in the war. Was a mission with zero bombs on my airplane. I flew as a wingman the whole time. Uh, flight lead I think was a uh, Major Palmer. And I went out and we went over to a, to a country just to the west of Vietnam where we weren't at, and we never were there, and that's my story, and I'm saying do it. But my first mission was to carry leaflets in two pods underneath the A4, go into this valley over just north of Japan in Laos, and hit the button, and blow the front, uh, back and front off of it, and drop all these leaflets, and says, surrender, you know, surrender will give you a good deal for the, uh, Viet Cong, for the uh, North Vietnamese that were over there. Uh, my lead told me, he says, we're not going to mess around with dropping these things lightly. So I want you to go down the valley, pull, you know, pick up about 450 knots, pull your plane straight up in the air, and then push the button and get rid of those damn leaflets in one big pile on the ground. And that's good enough for me. So that was my first mission in the A-4 Skyhawk. Let me just, I, uh, 
I knew a guy that was in a psychological operations unit in Vietnam, printing the leaflets, and he said that one of the problems they had was all the humidity on the ground tended to stick the leaflets together, and so they'd go out as a solid block. It wasn't great for the distribution pattern. Is that part of what you're talking about? That's, that's it, yeah. Yeah, one of the things about close air support, the difference between the missions we flew as, uh, as uh, forward air controllers and observation pilots, all of our missions in the A-4 were planned missions. When we, we got briefed, we took off, we usually had a good idea where we were going and what we'd be doing. We normally worked at that time, there weren't that many marine uh, forward air controllers in the air, airborne. Uh, so many of our missions were flown either with facts on the ground, uh, with the battalions, or they were flown over in Laos with Air Force forward air controllers flying the bird, the one bird dog. Uh, so we we meet up with we go over to the, wherever the target was. We meet up with them, talk with them. They would brief us on uh, how they wanted us to make the runnings and that. We'd drop our bombs and we'd go home. Uh, we did have a we did have a hot pad that we had various planes on with napalm or with rockets or with bombs, and those could be called up on a five minute alert. And you could end up going anywhere with that mission. That was when somebody really got in trouble and the FAC called back and said he needed help. Uh, they would launch either two or four Skyhawks out of that alert package and you'd head off to wherever you were going. And our idea was to be in the air within 10 minutes. From the time you left the, the hooch where we were sitting in, which happened to be air conditioned for once, uh, until we got in the airplanes and off to the end of the runway, we were in the air, headed for wherever the target happened to be that, uh, for that alert. I got launched a couple of times out of there on some strange missions. I got to inter do an intercept on a, uh, what, a quote, enemy bomber coming down from Hainan Island uh, up by China, which belongs to the Chinese. Ended up it was a uh, Northwest uh, 707 that we intercepted. Uh, something had gone wrong with his, uh, his identification friend and foe. So they sent out, launched us in A-4s. So we had you know, two 20 millimeter cannons. We're not fighters. And we're going to go up and save the world before they fire the Hawk missiles at them. Luckily, I spotted the red tail and knew exactly what it was uh, because I'd flown to uh, Okinawa on one of those on my way over. Second mission was another one right outside the Nang at the three map headquarters. We get launched out of Chulai. The Nang is half a mile away. We're 50 miles away. We get launched with two A4s carrying rockets and guns. In May of 1966, when they were having one of their rebellions in the Nang, one faction and the other faction, and they had tanks out there. And our job was to fly overhead. Uh, the Navy, the Vietnam had sky raiders up flying, and we were afraid they were going to go down and try to shoot the Marine troops on the ground. So we've got two A4s up there playing, playing fighter above the Arvin uh, A1s. And here's all the F8s and the F4s sitting on the runway at the night because they can't get in the air and get there as quick as we could. So again, some, some strange missions from time to time. Did you, uh, did you have a cl any close air support missions for infantry engaged on the ground where you had to bring it in real close or dependent on guidance from the FAC? Yeah, uh, a lot of times we had that. Uh, yeah. A lot of the missions were pre-planned. -pre talking sometimes to a ground FAC, sometimes to an airport. But you talk about your, your, your actual conversations, your communication with the, with the FAC then. You've got to, he's telling you where to go, but you're looking at a lot of trees or foliage down below, you can't really see the target. How does he mark it? How do you communicate so that you drop the bombs in, in the right place and don't make a catastrophic error, for example? Well, you're under positive control of the forward air controller. You don't drop unless he says clear it hot. So one of the things in the briefing would be, and I was a wingman. I shut kept my mouth shut, that was my job. Dash two's up, you know, that's it. Uh, so you listen to the briefing, he would give you, tell you what, what the situation was, he briefed you on the running headings, the altitude of the target, uh, which way he wanted you to pull off, uh, where a safe area was if you were out in the boonies somewhere, where's the safe area if you get hit that you can go and eject if you have to. And he would give you all the various information and he'd tell you, he knew what kind of ordinance we have because the lead would give him that when we, got, when we checked in. And he would tell you whether he wanted one bomb or two bombs or rockets or one napalm at a time, whatever he wanted. And he would give you that run in, and he would mark, going if it was an airborne fact, he would mark the target on the ground, either with a smoke rocket or with a smoke grenade. Uh, the old ones at that time, uh, and I flew some old, had some old one time. Uh, the pilots and the observers carried a bag of smoke grenades with them, and they could fly down and just pull the pin on, hold it out the window, fly over the target, and drop it. 
and hit the ground and whatever color smoke would come up would be called and he'd give you a position from I want you to hit uh, 12 o'clock 300 meters uh, 9 o'clock just like a clock you're running in on a running line I want you to go 9 o'clock from the smoke coming up at the 300 meters that makes you're going to drop the bomb or whatever it was over on the side here and usually what they would do with the troops is they would start bring, start you a little further away, see how good you were dropping the stuff, and then bring you closer to the troop line from there. Uh, the type of ordnance you carried dictated how close he would bring you. If you're carrying 250 pound bombs, you could have to be so many meters away from the troops. If you're carrying napalm, you could get closer. 20 millimeter, you could bring it right up next to them because those guns were pretty accurate. Uh, the Zuni rockets were the same way, a five inch rocket, supersonic rocket, very accurate. It always went where you pointed it. So we use those from time to time also. At the end of the mission, you, you go in and make your drops. You call in, uh, call down when you call in, I'm in, I'm in uh, target. And the fact would say, you take a look, he knew where you were. He watched you come down and he'd say, you're cleared hot. And he say, cleared hot. Make sure your armament switches are set. Do whatever it was you were supposed to do, drop or fire or whatever. Pull off the target and call off safe and move around again for the next one. When you finish, he would go down, take a look at the area, he'd call the lead up and give him a battle damage assessment or BDA. A uh, certain percentage of the bombs in the target area or whatever they were, napalm. Uh, if he'd gotten any report from the ground troops on people, how many uh, Viet Cong might have been killed, he would give you that. And uh, the biggest thing was you did not want to do anything to injure any of the American troops that you were working with. And that's who we, we work with most of the time. Marine Air supported the Marines. The 7th Air Force tried to get control of it, and he eventually did, because they wanted to use us for everything in the world. And our generals were very good about, and adamant about that, that Marine Air supported Marines. Uh, Dennis, you, you came into Vietnam in 68, I think? Right. So things were in high gear. Were you there for Tet? I came in right after Tet. Okay, but things were still pretty cranked up. Things were still pretty cranked up. There was still a lot of uh, residual stuff going on, and we were discovering uh, a lot of the after effects of, of that offensive. Now, um, you, uh, did you train in the States for what you actually flew and did in Vietnam? I trained at uh, Pendleton in California in uh, mid-68 uh, in the UH-1 Echo Kiwi gunship and then was assigned to a gunship squadron uh, in Vietnam at uh, Phu Bai, which was just uh, a few miles south of Way. But in, in your role, flying in a, in a gunship, were you a crewman as a forward air controller sitting in the back observing and talking on the radio? Were you a pilot? Were you a co-pilot? What was the actual function? How did you, how did you do your job? In the training, as, uh, in the training period, uh, we flew left seat, which was a co-pilot seat, and a more experienced pilot in the right showing you the ropes. And uh, at Pendleton, we went out to 29 Palms and uh, a couple of other ranges and practiced shooting the uh, armament. Uh, in Vietnam, the gunships out of way could carry as many as eight 30 caliber machine guns, uh, maybe 14 rockets, and uh, maybe a, a couple of handheld M79 40 millimeter grenade launchers in the back. Depends on what the crew chief could sneak on board. But they were pretty well armed, and you could uh, you could do a, a lot of holding action type uh, ordnance dispersion while you were waiting for something heavier. Once you got in the country, the training continued, and uh, you really weren't allowed to take command of a mission uh, until several weeks and sometimes months had passed. Flying it as a co-pilot in left seat. Just learning the ropes, getting a uh, feel for the land and the mission itself. We worked every day with ground troops. The reason we existed was to uh, support ground troops that were in trouble, and they were getting in trouble all the time. And uh, our first concern always was where are they and what can we do to help without doing damage to the people that we're supposed to be supporting. Um, so we flew several weeks. Uh, a variety of missions. Uh, we had a few slicks that we would take uh, out on medevac missions and that sort of thing. But primarily we were a gunship attack squadron and we uh, supported medevacs. We uh, ran cover for convoys 
if a team got into trouble on the ground, a battalion or a company, um, we tried to get there as fast as we could. We were usually first on station, and then we would take over the forward air control mission and determine what had to be done to remedy whatever situation. So in, in your view, your primary mission was forward air control. Perhaps a secondary mission as a gunship? Or how did you, how did they break down the... They were really one and the same. Uh, there were times when we went out that we were unable to use some of the other resources we had at our command. We had the power uh, and the authority to use naval gunfire, artillery, mortars, uh, bombers, other gunships, and our own ordnance. There were many times when weather, for example, or the set of the terrain, uh, or the condition of the crew on the ground, whatever team uh, or whatever friendly force we were trying to support, we couldn't use any of that other stuff. And so we used our own ordnance to try to buy time until we could figure out what else uh, we had available to us. Uh, and we could, uh, we could do quite a lot of damage uh, with just the ordnance that we carried on board. So uh, sometimes the ultimate mission was close air support and forward air control. And uh, other than that, the only common thing any of these missions had is that the troops on the ground took priority and you had to use every resource at your command to support them, but also to protect them and, and keep them from harm. So uh, sometimes you use your own ordinance, sometimes you uh, were able to use these other resources. Okay, I have a friend who was a Loach pilot in the 4th Infantry Division in the Army. Loach is a very small, small helicopter. He's in it. He's one other guy with a machine gun on the other door. And I, I understand their concept. They're in direct support. They're part of the cab unit that they were supporting. They, uh, um, they're right on top of the target. They have gunships above them or around them, and they mark a target. The gunships come in. But it's all fairly close in. You're talking about bringing in everything to include naval, naval gunfire. So you're up in the helicopter, you're flying around, the world's going by fairly quickly. How do you, how do you identify that point in the grid square on the ground accurately enough to bring in something like naval gunfire? Well, naval, uh, that, that example probably isn't the best one because we rarely used it. Uh, we never used naval gunfire in close proximity to friendly forces. Uh, they're bobbing around like a cork out in the South China Sea and uh, many miles away often. Uh, the closer you got to friendly forces, uh, the fewer options you had. You had to make that determination when you got on, uh, on site. The ideal was to use your own ordinance because you knew once you determined exactly where the team was, uh, and identified where the enemy troops were, uh, then you would go to work and very surgically uh, try to eliminate the, the hazard. If you had a little more room or if the numbers were such that you could uh, bring in bombers, uh, that was the next best option. Uh, and you, would, uh, you would get a report from the from a flight that came in, A4s or F4s or whatever uh, support flight came out, first thing they do is tell you what kind of ordnance they had on board. They might have had 500 pound bombs, they might have 8 pounds, they might have 20 millimeter cannons. Um, and then you determine which of that ordnance you're going to use uh, and in what order. And it all depended on the terrain and the proximity to the troops on the ground and what kind of hazards they were facing. You had to make those decisions on site, upon arrival, uh, and make the assessment and make the call. Uh, Chuck, your first tour, you were, you were flying a fixed wing and you were dropping bombs. And your second tour, you're a forward air controller. And do you think that made a big difference in your ability to be a, a, a controller? In your experience as, uh, as a fixed wing pilot dropping the ordnance? Uh, yeah, a lot of the things that uh, at least the Marine Corps did is everybody in the 
flew OV-10s over there early on from uh, July of 68 when they first came in country and even up until the time uh, after I got there, everybody was a second tour pilot. Now, they might have been a helicopter pilot in Hueys or 30, H-34s or in H-46s or in F-8s or F-4s, but everybody there uh, were captains, majors and above and were all second tour pilots. We'd all been out there doing something earlier, whether it was a you know, helicopter or whether it was doing the bombing. Uh, that was just the way it was set up. Uh, later on, we brought in some young lieutenants right out of the training command, and that made some changes on things. By the way, those were used as forward air controllers in Korea. Uh, so there were changes that came a long way. But yes, I think it helped quite a bit, not, not only just being an A-4 pilot and doing the bombing, but also my uh, ground tour was as, a, as a ground fact and working with it. I didn't work a lot of air, I did work some helicopter stuff, and doing the convoys, and working in the Division Air Office and learning what went on out there. I already knew what an aerial observer was. And in the OV-10, our back seaters were not pilots. They were observers. AOs, usually infantry officers or artillery officers. They tried to get artillery, but didn't always have that. Uh, all the way down to uh, tankers, MPs, and at least one lawyer that I know of that flew as an AO. My first mission when I got in country the second time was not with a pilot, it was with an AO in the back seat. So I flew my first mission in Vietnam in July of 1969 with an artillery officer in the back seat showing me the area. He was a qualified forward air controller himself. And he's the one that provided the additional training until I was designated as a forward air controller about a month or so later. I, uh, years ago I interviewed a guy who was an uh, artillery he was actually in an artillery battalion, and he was flying in, he was, he was in an L-4, I guess, in World War II, right? Very small plane. He was flying in the Philippines, and uh, he was taking a very slow, very low, and he was taking a lot of ground fire. And all of a sudden, the Japanese realized that it wasn't productive for them to shoot at him, because if they shot at him, he'd find out where they were. And, uh, and call in the world of artillery on them. And so what was your experience with ground fire? And did the, Viet, did the Viet Cong get that message, that's not to shoot at you? You were fairly slow, you were often probably fairly low. Were you vulnerable? What was your situation? Yeah, I guess I had some experience flying in the 01, my first tour. So I, we flew around the 01 with the windows open. You could hear it when they shot at you. Uh, the OV-10, windows were closed. You didn't want them open because the window came open, it would go across the top of the airplane and smash up an engine. Uh, so they did not shoot at you because they learned what the type of aircraft, whether it was a Huey gunship or whether it was us in the OV-10 or the O-2s, they normally did not shoot at you unless they knew they'd been spotted. And my favorite thing is you can, you can imagine some Viet Cong uh, PFC down there who decides to stand up and shoot at the airplane after it goes by. And just before we turn around and loose the wrath of the earth on him, his sergeant goes over to him, slaps him upside the head, and says, yeah, I told you not to do that. Now we've got to go hide somewhere until these guys are done bombing us. So, uh, yeah, they, they, for the most part, they, they, they would not shoot at you unless they knew they'd been spotted. Then it was no holds barred. And Dennis, uh, flying a helicopter, what was your experience in that regard? Uh, pretty much what Chuck said, uh, I had been in country for two weeks and they had been flying me in uh, missions that were relatively low risk because of my inexperience, but it was an opportunity to get familiar with the countryside, familiar with the uh, tactics. Uh, but uh, on the third day of my second week, I got shot down at the, right off the end of the runway at Fuba. Uh, it was at night and we had been up for uh, about three hours on patrol. We tried to keep an aircraft in the air uh, all the time so that if someone got in a jam, we could get there in a hurry. Uh, we were done and we were just coming in and someone popped out of the end of the runway and, and put 32 rounds of 30 caliber bullet into our Huey, uh, which created a sudden stoppage on the end of the runway. So uh, if they thought they could get away with it, they certainly weren't afraid to shoot at us. But if they identified you in the boonies as a fact, you probably had some free time to look around before they would open up on you. There were areas 
days where they had anti aircraft uh, set up, pretty sophisticated stuff. Uh, quad 50s and radar guided 12 millimeter and uh, some pretty sophisticated anti aircraft weapon. They didn't care who you were. If you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, they were going to shoot at you. Okay, now let's go back to your mission where you're coming in at Fubai and you get 32 rounds. You were fairly low? About uh, 50 feet off the ground, I guess. And that, that's a that pretty, guess that's fairly that's not a good situation, is it? It was, uh, it was not a good situation, but it gave us time. Uh, we were pretty close to the end of the runway, and we actually made the end of the runway. Uh, he, was, he came out of the hole right off the end of the runway. Uh, I don't know how I got there. He must have been pretty sneaky, but uh, uh, I had actually had time. One of my jobs, if we got shot up uh, or lost an engine, was to dump all the ordnance off of the aircraft. I had a handle to my right. Now, if I pulled that, a shotgun shell went off on those connectors that held rocket pods uh, on the aircraft and uh, knocked them off. So I got that done, and then we got on the controls because we were losing uh, hydraulics, and the Huey was really hard to fly if it didn't have hydraulics. And it took two of us to get it down on the end of the runway. And we had lost uh, tail rotor, so the thing was trying to spin around like a top at the same time. But you're, uh, you're able to make a, should we say, a semi-controlled landing? Semi-controlled landing. Uh, a very well-controlled sprint down the runway after I got down. <laughs> okay, are there, for either one of you, and maybe I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it, any particular forward air control story, particularly memorable incident? Like to share. Well, uh, one thing I'd like to point out is when I talked about when I flew the A-4 Skyhawk, we always had a particular mission we were going out on. We were assigned a certain target or meet a controller somewhere and, and do something. It might be a night TPQ mission where we were dropping bombs from 30,000 feet with a ground controller flying the airplane for you. In the OV-10s when I flew them, our mission was to take off, go out and fly for two hours and 15 minutes in the local area where we're supporting the 1st Marine Division. When you took off, you were in the air. You didn't take the time to get there, you were there. Our job in that case was to work with our observer, the aerial observer. He would be talking back to his people, and we might go out and check on the recon guys and out in the boonies to make sure they were okay and have them, have them check in. And we might go down and fire an artillery mission that might be doing a convoy escort. But we didn't know on many, on many of these missions what we were going to do because we could be called on to do anything involving the work we did in observation. Not necessarily forward air control. We were not forward air controllers like some of the Air Force guys were that flew over in Laos and that. Our job was to support the division and whatever that entailed. As it might be photography, it might be convoy escort, it might be artillery spotting, might be naval gunfire, it might be artillery registration, which was a fun mission. We brought artillery registration to the 175 guns. They could shoot miles. But when you did that, you'd climb up to about 8,500 feet or so and fly a U-shaped pattern at the end of the target they were going to practice shooting at to register the guns. What was great about 8,000 feet or so? The OV-10 did not have air conditioning. We had little vents that could blow on our faces. But on that, on, on artillery registration, you could climb up in the air, turn on the Radio Saigon or Radio Australia and listen to that on the HF radio and just cruise around for 45 minutes to an hour, hour and a half in nice cool air. And then come back down and land at Marble Mountain or Da Nang uh, where it was you know, 100 degrees and the humidity was about the same way. Danny uh, can probably talk to the amount of weight that we would lose sometimes on these missions, particularly the summer missions. Any, any particular group you want to talk about weight control first or not? <laughs> Or do you want to talk about uh, yeah, another you know, people that had a weight problem over there? Uh, I know our CO once, uh, at my second tour, uh, I was in the, with Chuck in the squadron, and our CO put a uh, thermometer in his helmet because he's, he's can uh, the uh, cockpit was like a greenhouse. There was 125 degrees in there, uh, so uh, there there weren't a lot of pudgies walking around the squadron, but. Uh, my first tour in the helicopter where I cut my teeth on forward air control missions. Uh, every mission was different, uh, but every mission was the same. You found out 
many times as Chuck said, after you left the base, you got out, you checked in with a patrol agency, and they said, okay, go to coordinates such and such, make contact with Pennyworth reconnaissance team, they've got a bad situation. So uh, that's what we would do. The AOs were, uh, as Chuck said, artillerymen or infantrymen, and they know how to talk to the guys on the ground. And they'd make contact and we'd find out what the situation was, and then we'd set up, we'd set up the mission. Uh, one particularly memorable uh, mission was, uh, it had all the elements. It was getting late in the day, a little bit dark uh, on the, uh, on the west side, and uh, it was raining. The ceilings were about 200 feet, and we had 200 Marines surrounded uh, down south of a hill called Hill 55, which was out in the middle of the swamps, and uh, there was an old French railroad berm that ran down through the middle of it, and they were backed up against that berm by an unknown number of, of Vietnamese regulars. We couldn't use air because they couldn't get underneath that stuff. We couldn't use artillery because they were too close to Hill 55, and we didn't know where everyone was. All we knew was we had to get them on the other side of that berm. So we got a couple of gunships, including Army Cobras, and uh, worked the other side of the berm and uh, made sure there was nothing over there friendly. And uh, then we started working around the perimeter of the friendlies, and eventually, after about 40 minutes, got everyone on the other side. Uh, they didn't leave anyone behind. They had seven dead and 18 wounded, uh, but about 180 guys got to the other side. They left no one behind. And that gave us an opportunity then to bring in some resupply aircraft, uh, H-46s, uh, to resupply them with water, food, and ammunition, and to take out their uh, wounded their casualties. But we, in the meantime, had taken a lot of hits. We were uh, pretty well perforated and a little bit concerned about how the machine was running. Jet engines don't cough and sputter. They either run or they don't. And uh, ours was showing signs of giving up the ghost, so we headed back uh, toward the main and our wingman followed us on our tail. Uh, we were leaking a lot of aviation fuel, and rather than try to make it back to base, we decided to put down in the clearing while our wingman ran cover for us. And uh, as soon as we hit the ground, just as we hit the ground, the engine quit. Probably fuel starvation. We grabbed uh, M60 machine guns, a bunch of hand grenades, some M79 grenade launchers, and I came for the side of the clearing, which was a ditch. It was full of slop and water and God knows what. And set up a perimeter until they could get an evacuation helicopter out there. I had uh, had a panel shot out from the front of the Huey, an observation panel, and it hit my legs and I was, they were kind of burning, so I was checking them out. And, uh, uh, hydraulic fluid line had been severed under my seat and so there was this red hot fluid squirting all over the front of the aircraft and uh, I thought I'd been hit but uh, it turns out I wasn't uh, and uh, the damage wasn't very severe but while I was checking out the legs in this ditch I looked and the ground was alive with little what we called step and a half snakes and I levitated out of there. Uh, I didn't even bother to tell anyone else that there was a problem because I think the screech that I let out let everyone know, so we grabbed all of our stuff and went to another location. <clears throat> and as it turned out, these were, uh, they're a miniature relative of a cobra, and uh, apparently they're quite deadly, but uh, we got out of there okay. But that was memorable. And uh, pretty soon, here come my uh, H-46 transport and uh, picked us up and the big H-46 came on, uh, or uh, H-53 Sea Stallion came on uh, while we were being uh, evacuated and hooked onto that Huey with a big strap and picked it up and took it back to the main along with us. So. But that, you know, you talk about those things and they happen every day. They sound a little bit uh, ferocious at times, but those kinds of things happen all the time. 
because it was that kind of an environment. You don't think too much about it, you just move on to the next thing. Yeah, probably the greatest thing in the missions was working with the recon folks and being able to get them out. And several years ago, I happened to be in uh, Duck, North Carolina at a restaurant. And had my hat on with the OV-10 on it. And had a gentleman come over and offer to buy me a drink. Ended up he had been on a recon team and been saved partially by our OV-10 action and bringing in the rescue team to pull him and the rest of his team out on a helicopter. And called his son over and his grandson over and he said, you guys are here today because of people like this. And that really makes you proud of the work that you did. And we did that every day. We did it all the time. And we didn't really think a lot about it. There were some people that didn't like the flying and gave up on flying over there. Back in my A4 days, we had a, a World War II Lieutenant General's son who decided he would not fly in combat and gave up his wings. Uh, that was very rare. When you got assigned to do the job, our guys went out and did it, and we did it every day. Didn't think about it. Went back to the club at night if you weren't on the night mission and had a good time, had party time, and really didn't talk much about what was going on. Did we have people killed? Yeah, we had a couple. And it does happen. Not as much in the OV as it did in the helicopters, but it did happen. In our war in Vietnam, working directly with the troops, was an awful lot different than if you talked to the OV-10 drivers who flew in Laos where there weren't any troops, and all they were doing was being shot at by really big guns and flying at 4,500 feet instead of us, who had little stuff mostly shooting at us, and we could go down around 1,000, 1,200 feet and really see what was going on. But uh, I have numerous friends that were in recon units. And for either one of you, what, what did you think when they came on the radio and they were whispering? Well, you knew they were in trouble, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah that means the enemy's close, but uh, they probably want you to bring it in real close to them. So. Yeah, it got, uh, there were times it was almost laughable uh, because you would hear yelling and uh, outgoing and incoming rounds going on and the radio man is on the radio in a very calm voice, this 19 year old, whispering to you to the point where you could barely understand him trying to direct you in. Now everyone in the world knew where these guys were, but out of habit they whispered um, instructions to us and would direct us in to accomplish that very first step in the mission which was find out where they are. Uh, and they would direct you in and give you a mark when you were directly over and then you used that as a starting point to uh, start the mission. A lot of times it was just clearing a path for them so they could move. They were surrounded or pinned down. Uh, the first step, if you couldn't get a if you couldn't get a medevac or an extraction helicopter into that spot, they had to be moved to a more defensible position, some high ground someplace. Uh, had they taken any casualties, how, how hard was it going to be for them to move? Uh, and you weighed all of those factors as you generated your plan. Okay, we have a couple minutes for a few questions. Any questions? What's the OB look like? It's a uh, twin-engine turboprop. If you know what a if you know what a Mohawk looks like uh, with the three tails, the OV-10 has two. Uh, built by North American Aircraft, built 360 some of them, uh, 117 for the Marines, 157 for the Air Force. Uh, actually, Marines use them all the way up into the Gulf War, and two of them shot down in the Gulf War. They're used now in California. Cal Fire uses them. They're painted up nice and white and orange and red. And these are the fire spotter aircraft. They fly around at altitude and they have air conditioning. And they tell the, again, a similar mission. They tell the fire bombers who are dropping the slurry in that where they want it dropped. Same thing, a little bit safer. Any other questions? Do they have any Yeah, there was the, 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 actually the uh, L-19 bird dog, or the O-1, was used from 19, by, the, by the U.S. in Vietnam and Laos from 1962 to 1975. Uh, the O-2, the Push Me Pull You, uh, which is basically a Cessna 337, the Air Force bought those are an interim aircraft 
before the OB-10 came into use. And those were used from the time they came in country in about 1966 or so, uh, all the way through the end of the war also. Uh, they were a pretty good plane. They couldn't carry a lot of ordnance on them, uh, but they were very good for night use uh, with the night scopes. And uh, the uh, folks in the Air Force used those extensively in Laos for night work. The OB-10 had a bad tendency to get reflections off the inside of the canopy because of the design of it. Okay, no questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.